Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on evaluating success and restoration, a coral reef restoration monitoring guide. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Reef Resilience Network and the Coral Restoration Consortium. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Shay Veeman, and I am the host and a speaker for today's webinar and the chair of the CRC's monitoring working group. I am happy to introduce today's presenters, the authors of the monitoring guide. Dr. Liz Gergen is a postdoc fellow at Qatar University, and she is the, the uh, leading the development of a coral reef restoration program. Stephanie Schottmeyer is an associate research scientist with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute's coral program. Dr. Allison Molding is a coral biologist at the NOAA Fisheries Southeast Regional Office, and Amelia Mora is the science program manager at the Coral Restoration Foundation in the Florida Keys. And I am also a presenter. Before we re begin, Next slide, please. I would like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be one hour and 30 minutes. The recording will be available on the CRC website and the Reef Resilience Network website afterwards. The presentation will be about an hour followed by a question and answer period. There will also be opportunity for additional Q&A. Please join the CRC's monitoring working group on December 2nd at noon Eastern time for our next working group semi-annual meeting where we'll be following up on this presentation. Another option is to take questions online on the Reef Resilience Network Forum, which is an interactive online community of coral reef managers and experts from around the world. At the end of the webinar, we'll provide instructions on how you can participate. During the webinar, there are two ways you can ask questions during the Q&A session. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions, and we'll keep track of these for the end of the presentations. Or you can raise your hand during the question and answer session, and one of us will call on you to ask your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbox next to your name. If you're having technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please type a message in the question box and we'll try to help resolve the issue. Next slide, please. Before we begin today's presentation, Please tell us a little bit about yourself by answering the following poll questions. I'll give you a few seconds to respond to the question and then we'll share your responses. So the questions are, I am a marine resource manager, restoration practitioner, scientist or researcher, student or other. Just give it a moment and then we'll look at the results. Awesome, we've got all sorts of folks here with us today, led by scientists and researchers. Great representation. And one more poll question at the beginning of the presentation is the second question is, what is the focused region of your work? Please select one of the following, the Caribbean, Atlantic and Florida, Western Indian Ocean, Middle East, Pacific Australia, or multiple other locations. Awesome, we've got representation from all over and some, some pretty early times and some of those time zones too. Great, thanks for participating in the poll. Next slide, please. Now I'm so pleased to hand over this presentation to the lead author of this guide, Ms. Gergen. Okay, thank you, Shay, for, for that beautiful introduction. Um, I'm going to continue with a few more introductions. I want to begin um, introducing all the folks that made this guide a truly comprehensive uh, resource. In order to make sure we covered all the topics thoroughly, including the most up-to-date technologies and address as many concerns as possible for the restoration, restoration community, we interviewed, invited, and asked a lot to the restoration community, both near and far. Therefore, we wanna give a huge thank you to this amazing support group for all the, the help that they provided along the way, from contributing, reviewing, 
being interviewed, editorial support, infographic design, and the many images that these folks and others provided to make the guide a beautiful resource. Thank you to you all. The presentation is going to start a little bit with the background of the guide, such as how the guide was developed and reasons why we chose the path we did. Then we will get more into the nitty gritty of many of the metrics that were developed. To benefit both the speakers and the audience, as Shay mentioned, we will be transitioning through a number of speakers as we go. So just bear with us in those transitions um, amongst the presentation. So here we go. This guide was developed due to a recognized need within the restoration research and management community that we need to have a more standardized way of monitoring our restoration efforts and talking about the success of our projects and programs. We did this across two different phases. The first was to gather the information that was already available in literature, guides, and in the minds of practitioners and managers. We looked to the literature not only from Coral Reef Field, but also beyond in forestry, oyster restoration, for example, to gather, on, gather ideas on how we need to frame the guide to answer the main questions of how do we measure success in restoration. Also vital to this, to how the guide was developed, was interviewing those involved in restoration. These discussions provided us what, with what they needed in order to monitor to meet their goals, such as what techniques or guidance or advice that they needed and also what they had been asked to provide, say by managers, funding agencies, or the general public. The second phase was really taking that information and, develop, and developing something useful for programs of all shapes and sizes. Our first conclusion was that there is no one size fits all model for monitoring restoration success due to the diversity of project goals and purposes. However, we can have standardized metrics which are collected regardless of the goal or purpose and then have metrics which can be tailored within the most popular goals of restoration. This idea was developed similarly in the Oyster Restoration Monitoring Guide. We worked thoroughly through many iterations of each metric. The toughest part was creating and deciding on the universal metrics. Uh, we reached out to experts, reviewers, literature, and even tested the metrics with mock data to get to where we are today. We realized changes may need to occur in the future once the guide and metrics are really tried and tested. Um, by many and as the ever evolving field of restoration grows. The purpose of this guide is to provide standardized protocols and metrics to aid in monitoring and describing the success of restoration. We want the metrics described within the guide to be able to detect early warning signs, describe success, and most importantly, be comparable and usable. We really strive to make this guide usable by all, especially the universal metrics, we tried to include methods for each metric that can be used on any budget, program size, and experience, with the ability to use more advanced techniques when available to you, but still with comparable outcomes. The guide is set up to guide you through almost everything you need to think about when developing a monitoring protocol. Every detail is not included, but the major thinking points and considerations are addressed along with resources to guide you on your way. No restoration is the same, and therefore all the metrics cannot and should not be used on all restorations. Therefore, our first task was to determine if there was a way in which success could be measured upon all restorations, regardless of the project goal or aspiration. We determined that there are basic measurements which could be used to describe each and every restoration in a meaningful way. We call these universal metrics, a term used within the Oyster Habitat Restoration Guide for metrics that link all restoration projects and should be universally used across the restoration community. These are five metrics that we can suggest collecting at all restorations and are also linked to the two other products developed by this working group, both of which I'll get, I uh, will touch on in uh, a couple of slides. In addition, we defined five restoration goals for which we developed a set of metrics that can be used to measure success at reaching that goal. These metrics will organize under each goal and some objectives can be chosen, customized to meet a program's need. These are also tied to our evaluation tool, which will aid in evaluating a particular program based on the metrics it is measuring. And common to both of these metrics are that they create a standardized way to collect data. They are then usable across all projects, programs, and regions, and are accommodating to all program levels. This graphic is depicting the organization of the categories, goals, and objects and metrics, uh, objectives and metrics within the guide. 
We will be introducing each of most of these at various levels um, of detail throughout the webinar, but wanted to share this broad view of the organization. First on the left, we have the five universal metrics, one of which is an environmental metric of temperature, and the other four span four scales of data collection from broad landscape level detail down to the genetic makeup of the corals used for restoration. As you can see, there are no goal or objective links to these metrics. On the right hand side are the metrics which align with the five goals, which are in blue. We used in the, in the guide, which are ec ecological, socioeconomic, event driven, climate change adaptation, and research. Below each of those goals in yellow are the objectives within those goals, followed by the metric that we suggest measuring in order to help evaluate the success of meeting the associated objective or goal. And just briefly, I want to provide a couple more details regarding the integration of this guide with two other valuable products the working group has, this working group has produced. We feel that these two products really make this guide an all-encompassing resource. The Core Restoration Database provides a place in which the universal metric data can be entered and observed. The data entered there then can be tracked over time to evaluate success of your program and, help, and also help the restoration community learn from others and improve our success. Included in this database is an interactive map that will show where in the world restoration is, being, is occurring, the scale, the techniques being used, and also contact information. The second product is the evaluation tool. Every metric defined in the guide has an evaluation criterion or more associated to it, meaning we provide a way to evaluate yourself if you are meeting the suggested outcomes. This is a binary system, and when evaluated across all the metrics being collected, it will provide the user with a percentage. The higher the percentage means the suggested criteria are being met. Lower percentages indicate that there are areas that a program may be able to improve upon. Both of these tools are still a bit under development um, and will be online in the near future. The product leaders listed here, Allison and Stephanie, um, can be contacted for more information or to enter your data um, into the database. Now that you have a little bit of background on the guide, we are going to go into the details of all the universal metrics. These will be given in a little bit more detail than the rest of the metrics um, because they will be used by all. And then after that, we will go through the goal-based performance metrics. So to start with the universal metrics, this infographic, which is created by Christina Gomez-Cortez from Coral Hero, depicts the five universal metrics we have chosen um, we have chosen such as landscape uh, or the reef level metric, population level, colony level, genetic and genotypic diversity, and temperature. Again, it suggested that each of these be monitored on every restoration site, therefore being universal amongst restorations worldwide. Amelia and myself are going to introduce these to you in more detail, detail over the next few slides. To start with universal metric number one, Landscape reef level metric, restored reef aerial dimension, is designed to measure the aerial impact of restoration. In other words, how big is the area that is encompassing all of the corals that were outplanted? And then how did this change over time? This is a particularly important metric for those working with ephemeral species, such as the acroporas, as they have the ability to fragment and reattach more quickly within a site than, say, mounding or boulder corals or soil growing corals. This is measured by tracing in some fashion the boundary of the outplant plot, which is seen in orange on this figure. And this is the area in which you outplanted to. The area is measured during the first survey or following new outplanting and acts as the baseline from which other measurements are compared. During the subsequent events, the ecological footprint will be measured, which is in blue on the diagram. This area will be um, in, in which the restored corals are found. As shown in this figure, time one is the time of outplanting. The orange area is the initial area. And this, at this time, it equals ecological footprint. As time passes, as represented by time two, corals may have become dislodged or fragmented, reestablishing themselves around the site or perhaps died. The ecological footprint drawn in blue shows the expansion of the restored area, also known as the area impacted by restoration. These measurements can give us a reef level look at restoration and the ability to communicate how restoration is impacting the reef beyond the location that it was planted. Because as we all know that restoration impacts on a reef go beyond the small footprint of where a coral was planted. 
The more common data collection technique is to fate track colonies over time. And while this is good for some things, it misses the naturally occurring phenomenon, which has implications for describing the impact that restoration has on a site. So not reporting this level of data, um, such as going beyond where the coral is planted, could mean that we are reporting that the restoration is not successful. However, by looking broader to the landscape level of a project, these details can be reported and provide a larger picture about the impact of restoration. There are various ways that this metric can be collected. The preferred method is in-situ tracing, where a diverse snorkeler can trace the outplanted plot and ecological footprint. Additional methods include using a tape measure to measure the length and width of the ecological footprint, as shown on the top figure. Uh, this is best represented by a shape shown, uh, shown here. To the best of the practitioner's ability, they should try to define the shape, the best shape that fits their restoration. We recognize that the shape or designs of restorations are variable. And in the guide, you'll see this depicted on examples of different outplant designs that were provided to us by practitioners. Then, if resources allow, the use of mosaics or other mapping techniques can be used. As shown in the bottom figure, is the use of a mosaic to obtain the ecological footprint. In red is the first tracing of the outplant plot, and the white is the secondary tracing upon the mosaic. This change in area can show us how the ecological footprint can change over time, and in this case, we're seeing growth. The total area of the ecological footprint should be reported per site or per project, per site per project. Um, for this metric, we provide guidance on defining um, what a site is within the guide. And we suggest that um, at minimally this be collected immediately following outplants, then annually and following any disturbance such as a hurricane, bleaching, or disease event, grounding, or similar event. So the into universal metrics two and three. Uh, metric two is population level metric, which measures restored population size structure. And the universal metric number three, which is a colony level metric, measures the amount of tissue on the restored colonies, um, for example, a proxy of, of colony health. Because universal metric two and three are pretty similar, I'm going to present them, them together to save some time. Um, and you may think they should be the same metric. Therefore, I will first introduce the data that are collected and then provide your reasoning as to why we actually chose to keep them separate throughout the universal metric. These data are collected by estimating the greatest diameter of a colony and estimating the amount of live tissue per colony on every restored colony or a subset of colonies within the ecological footprint. So within the area you just measured in universal metric one. We determined that the most repeatable measurement is that of the entire skeletal unit. In most instances, this may be may also be the quickest way to collect the data as a surveyor is not determining the largest area of tissue or measuring each individual type tissue isolate. We recommend that both these data types be collected in bins. Therefore, each colony does not need to be precisely measured. Something similar to what you see of these two example data sheets where the data collector can simply tally by species within the ecological footprint. These data collections can be done with two simultaneous surveyors uh, or more for each type of data. These metrics require minimal equipment can be done with a data sheet and a measuring device of your choice. Similar to universal metric one, these data can also be collected using large scale imagery, such as a mosaic, does not, but does require computational power to do so, um, which is referenced in the webinar, Photo Mosaics is a tool for monitoring coral restoration success, which was given last July, and you can find a link to that webinar in the appendices of the guide. From these two metrics, we can obtain a variety of outputs, such as the mean colony size, abundance distribution, population growth, number of colonies with partial mortality and survival um, amongst others. And when these two metrics are combined, we can also get a rough estimate of the total tissue, meter squared of tissue density and cover at a site. We suggest collecting these data immediately following outplanting at three months and then annually um, and or following a disturbance. We suggest a three month monitoring occurs within the first three months. Um, so this will give a practitioner the ability to correct course if needed. Now I'd like to briefly discuss why we separated these two metrics as you might still be seeing um, why, why they aren't combined. 
And we designed all of the universal metrics to be quick, yet informative and comparable. Well, the output from universal metric two will provide a distribution of colony size and a rough idea of colony growth. This could be misleading if all the colonies are mostly dead. You may be thinking that someone would report universal metric two, that they have huge colonies, which will show their colonies are growing and a program may be successful. But this may not be true because it doesn't take into consideration colony health or live tissue. However, as designed, the universal metrics should be presented together, meaning we need the data from the all five metrics to accurately describe the restoration project. So when the data from both universal metrics two and three are presented together, we can understand at a basic level how the project is performing. In this example, when universal metric two is presented with three, we will be able to determine if the colonies are generally healthy, such as having a high abundance of colonies with live tissue or not. So why not pair the, pair the measurements? We discussed this, however, we chose not to have paired data collection in order to move away from individual colony measurements or fate tracking method within the universal metrics and to reduce the time that was spent collecting data. This means the data are not directly related. In other words, we're not reporting which size classes has the most or least amount of tissue, but we're asking for the distribution of, size, of sizes of the colonies and the distribution amount of live tissue per colony. We really felt that this was the most repeatable method amongst users to get comparable data and the quickest way to collect the data. We weren't looking to add anything to a practitioner's, uh, practitioner's time out in the field. Of course, more detailed metrics on coral health and size can surely be collected and we recommend that you collect more than just the universal metric. And these should be done to fit the needs of your program. And these are included in the goal-based metrics as Stephanie, Shea, and Allison will touch on a bit later. Or if your program chooses, these measurements can be completed as paired, measure, paired measurements, but not required within the universal metric. I will now turn it over to Amelia, who will present the final two universal metrics within the guide. Amelia? Okay. Thank you, Liz. Um, and thank you all again for joining us today. We are really excited about the turnout for presenting this guide. Um, as Liz mentioned, I'm going to walk us through the last two universal metrics um, and then another poll. So the fourth universal metric is genetic and genotypic diversity. Genotypic diversity is a measurement of the number of unique genotypes that are used for restoration by species. This genetic and genotypic diversity metric serves to evaluate a program's contribution to genetic or genotypic diversity at a nursery or outplant site. It's an especially important metric uh, to estimate the potential for future species genetic diversity through sexual reproduction. This metric was identified as a universal metric because genetic diversity is such an important driver of long-term facilitation of species recovery and conservation. So this metric can also be used as an intra-program metric to ensure genetic and genotypic diversity um, across or amongst restoration sites within one group's operation. In the guide, genet is defined as the collection of ramets that represent a unique coral genotype. We as authors recognize that not all restoration programs have the resources to collect and have samples processed for genetic analysis. And therefore, we offer other factors such as geographic distance to be used to designate putative geno genotypes. It's worthy to note that most monitoring methods listed within this guide are structured to, to get away from or avoid colony fate tracking monitoring, but monitoring for these genetic-based successes may be of interest to some, if not most, restoration practitioners. And therefore, monitoring strategies to document the success of individual genotypes should be determined as part of additional research goals, which we will cover um, a little bit later in the goal-based section. So the guide gives a brief overview of three possible sequencing techniques um, listed here on the slide, microsatellites, SNP chip, and reduced tag representation to be rad. And then of course, the last one I mentioned earlier, which is just geographic distance to determine ge genotype diversity. However, we wanna make it clear that this is not an exhaustive list and other methods can be considered and used, um, but these are meant to be examples and used as a guide. 
For this metric, the required units or the recommended reporting is the number of genets propagated or outplanted by species with a note for the method used to determine oral genotype. Success is measured by maintaining or increasing the genetic diversity at a restoration site. And if you're looking for any further guidance on how to select unique genotypes, um, you can look in this guide, but also there are many good resources put forth by groups such as the CRC Genetics Working Group who helped us with this session. For reporting frequency, we recommend that these data be recorded at the time of outplanting or installation in a nursery first, and again with any subsequent additions or outplants. If differences in genotype performance at outplant site is of interest, then again, we recommend adding additional metrics that would be more under the goal-based section. Liz, next slide. Okay, so now I wanna shift gears for a moment and address the last universal metric, which is actually the only environmental or universal environmental metric. So there's no question that water quality is important to the existence, conservation and management of coral growth and a healthy coral reef community. And although there is a long list of environmental data that would need to be collected to fully understand the effect of water quality on coral restoration, many or most of those are out of the scope of restoration programs, either financially, physically, or logistically. Therefore, water temperature was identified as the only universal metric in this guide for coral restoration because it's generally easily obtained, affordable, and comparable across various scales. Um, in addition, water temperature is one of the key environmental metrics that can assist and understand uh, phenomena like coral growth, disease, or bleaching. We offer a few options for how to collect these data, ranging from in-water sensors installed and maintained by your organization or perhaps a partner organization to just mining the existing open access data sources. Uh, these data should be reported as maximum, minimum, and monthly mean averages uh, in degrees Celsius if possible at each restoration site or set of local sites. But of course, the data, the type of data collected or available will determine that frequency of sampling. So ideally, the temperature would be reported constantly at representative restoration sites to provide daily averages. Um, but if the equipment and resources are not available for this frequency, then we recommend at least monthly or seasonal temperature points um, be taken to provide representative changes in or ranges in water temperature to inform our understanding of restoration program success. Liz, next slide. Okay, so this concludes the universal metrics section of the guide. Um, and for this presentation, explaining all of the five metrics we recommend reporting across all restoration projects, regardless of uh, designated purpose. In the next section, we'll walk through those goal-based performance metrics designed for more specific project goals. But before we get to that, we'd like to ask for your feedback in a short poll to get an idea of how many of these metrics you're already looking for and assessing in your restoration program. So I'll give everyone a minute, but we're looking to um, select one or more of the following of the five universal metrics that you're already monitoring for, landscape, reef level, population level, colony level, genetics, and temperature. Okay, thank you everyone for participating. And it's um, actually really exciting to see such a big spread across all of the metrics. Um, I'm really glad that everyone is here to learn more about um, how we're recommending you collect them and report them in a unified manner, but it's really awesome to see that so many of these are already being used. So thank you very much for participating. Um, and now I'm handing this presentation over to Steph to walk us through the goal-based. Okay, thanks, Amelia. Um, so as Liz mentioned, uh, goal-based performance metrics were developed for restoration programs or projects 
with specific goals or objectives in mind, such as ecological or ecosystem restoration, socioeconomic benefits, event-driven restoration, climate change adaptation, and research. These goal-based metrics should be assessed in concert with other universal metrics to gauge the overall success of the restoration. And I'd like to give a big thank you to Christina Cortez from Coral Hero for creating this wonderful infographic. Next slide, please. Okay, so before we get into these goal-based performance metrics, we wanted to do another poll. Um, and for this poll, we would like uh, for you to, let's see, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we want to know what are your goals for restoration? Uh, you can answer uh, as many of these as possible. So are your goals, overall goals, ecological, socioeconomic, event-driven, climate change adaptation, or research? And it looks like 89%, the majority of everyone is uh, doing conducting restoration for ecological or ecosystem restoration uh, with the next being climate change adaptation. So there is a little bit of a range here, which is, which is pretty cool. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so first of all, uh, for those of you that responded that your goal is ecological or ecosystem restoration, we will first be discussing the goal-based metrics we developed to evaluate the success of coral population enhancement in community and habitat enhancement. Next slide. I'm trying to make sure that I keep up here. Okay. So coral population enhancement is the process of preserving or improving the ecological function, genetic species diversity, overall reef health, and or long-term sustainability of a reef through the outplanting or stabilization of corals. Uh, there are several key parameters that have been identified as important for monitoring during coral population enhancement to evaluate success. And those are coral abundance and cover, reproductive capacity, and seeing that those corals are reaching maturity, the overall coral condition, increases in species richness and diversity, and the effectiveness of indirect seeding of sexual recruits. Now, we should note that not all projects or programs may use all of these metrics depending on their specific restoration goals. Next slide. So tracking the abundance and percent cover of outplants provides an indication of coral growth, population spreading, and survivorship. And successful outplanting should either maintain or show an increase in coral abundance and percent cover following population enhancement activities as previously described by Liz for the universal metrics number two and three. Now abundance and percent cover data may be collected via surveys within the Restored Reef Aerial Dimension or RAD, uh, various types of transects, plots, or quadrats within the restoration area, or they can be extracted from mosaics. Now abundance Abundance should be reported as the count of individual corals used for restoration, while percent cover should be reported as the percentage of space occupied by live tissue within that restored area. Abundance and percent cover should be monitored at the time of initial outplanting and at least annually thereafter, as well as after any type of disturbance event 
and long-term if possible. In addition, it's important to note that baseline data should also be collected on the presence and abundance of existing colonies at the site. Next slide, please. The second metric for coral population enhancement is reproductive capacity or maturity. The ultimate goal of coral restoration is that restored coral populations actually become self-sustaining and contribute to the ecosystem through sexual reproduction and recruitment. Therefore, monitoring the reproductive capacity or identifying that outplants have become mature also indicates the coral's health and their potential contribution to the broader ecosystem. So we'd like to thank the CRC Larval Propagation Working Group for their help with developing these metrics. So determining if outplants have reached uh, maturity or are sexually reproductive can be determined a number of ways. First, through spawning observations. Uh, you can see table 15 in the guide or check the Larval Propagation Working Group website for the most up-to-date spawning predictions. You can also determine uh, uh, sexual reproduction through um, based on the colony size and age. Within the guide, you can uh, reference table 16 and 17 for the approximate minimum colony area, diameter, and age at reproductive maturity for select Caribbean coral species. You can also uh, try histology or branch breaking to look for mature or developing gametes which, within adult colonies. However, these methodologies can be time consuming, um, can also be costly, and can be potentially harmful to the colonies themselves. The CRC Larval Propagation Working Group has developed data collection protocols for spawning observations, which can be reported directly to their website. While the number of colonies observed with and without gametes and the size or age of colonies observed should, re should be reported to program-specific databases. And monitoring should occur annually. Next slide, please. The third metric is coral condition. In addition uh, to metrics that document changes in the amount of live tissue cover for the outplants, it's also important to determine what is causing declines in coral health, such as disease, predation, bleaching, or physical impacts, and then incorporate preventative maintenance and management into restoration plans. Such data may be collected through RAD surveys, mosaics, transects, quadrats or plots, roving diver surveys, or by fate tracking individual or a subset of colonies. It's important to note that accurately evaluating the condition of a restored coral population that control sites must be sim simultaneously be evaluated for the same criteria so that you know whether or not conditions are affecting both the restored and the wild populations. Reporting coral condition may be through presence absence, prevalence, or the percent of tissue loss caused by a specific condition. The frequency of monitoring should correspond with the timing of other monitoring events or after disturbance events. However, there are some variables such as to capture bleaching events. Monitoring may be conducted annually during peak water temperatures, while surveys should be conducted weekly to monthly during disease events to track progression. Next slide, please. The uh, fourth metric for coral population enhancement is species richness and diversity. So there is an ever increasing need for restoration programs to focus on multi-species propagation and restoration to ensure the conservation of valuable coral species and maintain potential resilience. 
Therefore, restoration of species, species richness and diversity is becoming more popular amongst restoration programs. Monitoring richness and diversity may be conducted through surveys within the RAD, extracted from mosaics, roving diver surveys, or within transects, plots, and quadrats. Species richness is reported as the number of species present, as a, present at a site. Diversity takes into account both the number of species present and the dominance or evenness of species in relation to one another, and therefore is reported as the Shannon Index. And further still, we can calculate species evenness which is a diversity index or a numerical measure of how equal the community is between sites. It's also important to note that to accurately evaluate potential changes in species richness and diversity, a baseline study must be completed prior to outplanning to characterize initial species diversity at the site and that these metrics should be monitored annually. Next slide. And finally, the fifth metric for coral population enhancement is uh, metrics developed for indirect seeding of sexual recruits. For programs utilizing indirect seeding on artificial substrates, we wanted to provide monitoring metrics that would be helpful in evaluating the effectiveness of settlement and the fate of these settlers over time. So we'd like to thank the Larval Propagation Working Group for their assistance in developing these metrics. For restoration scale activities, we recognize that only a, sub, a subset of substrates would be manageable to monitor individually. So we recommend that at least 30 substrates per site or treatment are monitored to account for the high degree of variability in settlement among individual substrates. Methods for documenting sexual recruits via indirect seeding include monitoring the number of substrates that are retained at each site, pre and post outplanting settler abundance, the size of settlers over time, and benthic cover within plots and quadrats. Data are reported as the proportion of substrates that are retained within the restoration area, the proportion of outplanted coral settlers surviving at a given time, and the yield or the proportion of substrates that can be relocated on the reef and that retain at least one live coral at a given time. For outplantings related to research, monitoring should occur at one, three, six, and 12 months but for other types such as general population enhancement, monitoring should probably occur at six and 12 months. And as usual, monitoring should occur after all disturbance events. So now I would like to pass things back over to Shay, who is going to present the metrics for community and habitat enhancement. Thank you, Steph. An ecological goal for coral reef restoration is to restore the functionality of the coral reef community and habitat. This can be assessed in multiple ways. Here I'll overview four metrics for assessing the coral reef community and habitat, invertebrates, reef fish, reef structural complexity, and habitat quality. Coral reef invertebrates have a broad diversity of form and function. And invertebrates can perform key functions such as habitat provision, algae control, or serve as an important source of food for fish and other uh, reef uh, denizens. The purpose of this metric is to quantify how restoration related changes in corals or in reef structure affects the invertebrate abundance and diversity. Macro invertebrates can be sessile or mobile, and micro invertebrates tend to be cryptic. So this means they have to be monitored in, in some different ways. Sessile invertebrates can be surveyed using transects or imagery and can be reported as percent cover or density of individuals. 
Mobile invertebrates can be surveyed using bell transects or roving diver surveys and also reported as density individuals. Cryptic species, however, because of their nature, uh, are tough to pick up on, on transects or with roving diver surveys, and they're often monitored using autonomous reef monitoring structures, arms, with um, species reported as presence absence. The invertebrate community can be surveyed at the initial restoration for baseline and annually thereafter. A goal of many coral reef restoration projects is to provide functional reef fish habitat to support biodiversity and fishery species by increasing the reef fish abundance and species diversity. Additionally, of course, fish can provide important ecological functions that may promote successful coral reef restoration, including grazing of reef substrata, preying on coral abores, and providing nutrient input. As part of the evaluating the effectiveness of coral reef restoration projects, Monitoring changes in the reef fish community is useful to quantify the benefit of increased coral abundance to the reef fish community and to better understand variability in restored coral condition that may be related to fish abundance. Some methods used to monitor reef fish communities include stationary cylinders, transects, roving surveys, and video or stereo imagery. This data can be reported as species, density, diversity, size, and biomass. And the fish community can be surveyed at the time of the initial restoration for a baseline and annually thereafter. The next um, metric under ecological restoration for community habitat enhancement is reef structure and complexity, which is a measurement of the vertical structure of the coral colonies and the reef structure used for restoration. This metric is very important as it can be used as a proxy, proxy for habitat complexity and reef creation. In addition, reef height is one of the most important metrics considered when calculating a reef's contribution to coastal protection. Over time, reef structure and complexity should show an increased trend with rest, increasing trend with restoration. Reef structure and complexity includes the restored corals as well as any engineered substrate that may be added as part of the restoration, including inclusion of any engineered structures, of course, will also change the reef structure and complexity. An increase in reef structure and complexity from coral restoration is related to the growth rate of the coral species that were restored, which will, of course, relate to the frequency needed for monitoring. After the initial restoration or after addition of engineered structures, after a disturbance such as a hurricane, and regularly, such as annually, is what we recommend for monitoring frequency. And our last um, part of the community and habitat enhancement goal for ecological restoration is habitat quality. As restored corals grow and flourish, there is an assumed positive feedback loop with the ecosystem that the, the quality of the direct restoration area and the surrounding habitat quality will change. A healthy reef ecosystem will not only provide a balance of diversity and abundance of invertebrates and vertebrates, as well as reef structure and complexity, as described previously, but it should also host um, a positive water quality, reduce negative interactions, and increased coral recruitment. This metric aims to capture the changes or effects that restoration has on water habitat quality through a wide variety of measurements, including water quality measurements, sedimentation measurements, benthic composition, and coral recruitment rates. By establishing comparative metrics and parameters related to habitat quality, restoration practitioners will have a better understanding of the impact that restoration activities have beyond coral outplanting and will help explain restoration success or failure. Because this is a wide variety of um, metrics, methods are also um, quite broad. Methods can include sediment traps and depth for sediment, um, secchi disk for, for or a light meter or par for um, water quality or turbidity, and for coral recruitment, transects, plots, and or photo mosaics, as described previously. This data should be collected at the time of initial restoration for a baseline and, and annually or after an event thereafter. Okay, so we have another poll for you all. We'd like to know which of these ecological 
restoration metrics that you use. Please select all that apply, abundance cover or species richness and diversity, reproductive capacity, maturity, or indirect seeding of sexual recruits, coral condition, invertebrate or reef fish community, and reef structure complexity or habitat quality. So we'll give you just a minute to fill those out. And we'll look at the results as soon as uh, as soon as the poll closes. Here we go. Wow, it's really great to see such a wide um, wide response and very diverse. Great, we are very encouraged to see this. I'm gonna switch gears now and move on from the ecological metrics into some socioeconomic metrics. Specific goals described in the guide are economic goals and sociocultural goals. Within the economic goals, we describe two specific ones. The first is for coastal protection, and the second is responsible ecotourism opportunities. So climate stressors such as sea level rise, more powerful waves, and more frequent and intense hurricanes are increasing the flood risk to coastal infrastructure and communities. Coral reefs dissipate wave energy up to 97%. It's very impressive. Um, reef restoration and the addition of engineered structures have the potential to contribute to wave attenuation on degraded reefs, but would require scaling up beyond the small restoration sizes that have been used to date. And this is a field of active development by oceanographers, economists, engineers, and ecologists. Coastal protection can be quantified in a couple different ways, really, but we're looking at the, the economic valuation of the co coastal economy, such as property and natural property values and natural resources. Another way is to measure the change in uh, wave attenuation and inundation that reaches the shoreline. Monitoring and reporting frequencies need to capture the range of normal conditions and then the change resulting from the restoration, as well as potential um, extreme events as well. Moving on to responsible tourism, ecotourism opportunities, and many thanks to Rennie Myers, who is the architect of this section. So, tourism can contribute to the local economy and can also extract resources from the local environment and economy. There are numerous opportunities for a community to leverage tourism development and change the impact of those activities on the environment, such as developing responsible ecotourism. Locals should be empowered to define what responsible tourism activity looks like for their community during the planning process for the restoration and ensure that plan is completed. Beyond good intentions, Ecotourism requires effective planning and local management of resources in order to prevent potential negative impacts of travel-related emissions, infrastructure development, and community disenfranchisement. A well-developed, responsible coral reef restoration ecotourism program has the potential to attract visitors to participate in a unique experience that can shape tourists' relationships to the marine environment and foster global st stewardship of coral reef ecosystems. The economic benefit from these activities can extend to dive and snorkel shops, hotels, and local shops and restoration projects. Uh, excuse me, local shops and restaurants. Restoration projects that have the goal of increasing tourism should do so responsibly and with the awareness that tourism infrastructure can exacerbate environmental stressors, economic inequality, and erode local sovereignty. And now I'll pass it over to Allison for our next socioeconomic metrics. Thanks, Jay. Um, so the next set of restoration objectives that are identified in the guide focus on sociocultural aspects of restoration. Some restoration programs involve the local community and restoration efforts. 
And one of the benefits of doing this is that they may get sustained participation that ensures viability of their program into the future. The monitoring guide identified three metrics to identify community engagement with coral restoration. These include cultivating stewardship through education and outreach, capacity building, and reef user satisfaction. And I'll describe each of these on the next few slides. Restoration programs that incorporate an education and outreach component, um, they, they do so in order to um, increase knowledge and stewardship of participants, but also to leverage volunteer participation and resources. When establishing a restoration program for education or improving stewardship, concepts um, that should be considered include communication strategies, marketing, participate, participant demographics, and behavioral changes of the participants after they go through the program. Um, measuring impact of education and outreach may be complicated unless the proper tools and monitoring are established from the start. So the monitoring guide suggested a number of methods to quantify community participation and level of stewardship. Um, one of these is event or campaign statistics, like the number and demographics of participants, which can be recorded to provide information about the people participating. Uh, participation assessment can be achieved using pre and post surveys to evaluate knowledge gained after going through the program. The reach of social media, online resources, and media coverage can be tracked using analytics, such as number of times a page is visited, um, from what country of origin and what from what type of device. Ongoing engagement can be tracked by number of repeat participants or volunteers throughout the year. And outplanting scope can be evaluated by the number of corals outplanted by volunteers. And these suggestions are not exhaustive, but they're just intended to give some examples of methods that could be employed to evaluate community participation and stewardship. Next slide, please. Capacity building is the cultivation of skills, knowledge, and resources that are necessary to increase long-term sustainability of a restoration program into, in the community. Future investment in coral restoration depends on whether the restoration program is economically sustainable and if it has the capacity to operate and maintain coral restoration activities. The guide suggests methods to increase the sustainability of restoration program operation and maintenance, to track education and citizen capacity building, and to evaluate the economic sustainability of the program. Many of these methods are also included in the previously described sociocultural and economic metrics, so they may be a little bit familiar to you since we've gone over some of these already. Um, participation surveys can be used to evaluate participants before and after going through a program to evaluate um, a knowledge, awareness, or, or understanding that's gained. The level of ongoing participation can be tracked by quantifying the annual number of volunteers, number of repeat participants, and the number of dives. Additionally, evaluations of diving and outplanting skills can help identify where there may be additional training needs. Outplanting scope can be evaluated by comparing restoration and data collection undertaken by volunteers to that that's undertaken by experts to evaluate effectiveness of outplanting and accuracy of data collection performed by volunteers. Um, and analyzing the program's budget can provide information about its sustainability. Total costs of project planning and implementation should be considered, including person hours, travel, communication materials, supplies, equipment, and administrative costs. Also, there should be an exit strategy in place with sufficient funds that are allocated to responsibly remove nursery structures and I'll plant any remaining corals in, case, in the case that a restoration program is no longer financially sustainable. Next slide. Allison, I hate to interrupt you, um, but we actually can't hear you right now. Is there another microphone or something that you could use? Or check um, check your audio, maybe? Um, did you oh, hear any of it? <laughs> your last <laughs> sentence or so. Um, no, we, we heard a lot, but but I think um, just, just your last sentence or so we couldn't hear. But we can hear you now. 
So. Okay, so should I start it from refuser satisfaction or did you hear um, some of the methods? Um, I would go back over the methods. Okay, so sorry about that. I noticed when I um, clicked over that somehow I was on mute, but I don't think I did that, so I don't know what happened. Okay, so sorry, I'll start with the methods again. So um, the um, interviews can illustrate how people um, are using the reef and if they perceive and value the effects of coral restoration. Um, the guide provides some example questions that could be used in survey design. Um, monitoring how local resident community members engage with coral restoration can also be achieved through interviews and surveys. Um, asking residents about their concerns about the reef and whether or not they feel involved in proactive measures to improve um, coral reef condition can help evaluate if locals feel empowered or disenfranchised. Working with stakeholders to identify opportunities for community owned and led restoration projects can help with user support of and satisfaction with coral restoration. And monitoring reef user satisfaction is a good indicator of the success of the communication strategy and project integration with community use priorities. Next slide. Okay, so um, we're gonna pause again for another poll. I promise this is the last one. I hopefully you're all, not all pulled out, um, but we wanna know which of the socioeconomic metrics you use um, when monitoring your restoration program. And you can um, select just one, I guess, for this one. I thought you could select multiple. See if you can select multiple. If not, um, I guess you're just limited to one. So choose the one that's most um, applicable. So we have responsible ecotourism opportunities, coastal protection, cultivating stewardship through education and outreach, capacity building, or reef user satisfaction. Okay, so it looks like most people are um, evaluating for cultivating stewardship through education and outreach, but all of the um, different categories had answers. So that's um, interesting to see. All right, um, so now we're gonna move on to the last three goal-based objectives that are identified in the guide. And these are event-driven restoration, restoration to improve adaptation to climate change, and restoration research. Next slide. Um, unplanned disturbances like disease, bleaching, or physical impacts from storms or vessel groundings can impact corals both on natural reefs and on coral restoration sites. And the purpose of monitoring may be to evaluate the effects of an event on a previously conducted restoration, or it may be to monitor restoration that was conducted to respond to an event. In either case, the universal and goal-based metrics um, and methods described in the guide can be followed, so there's no new ones, but um, the monitoring may be may need to be done um, more frequently to evaluate the impact of an event on restoration. Next slide. Testing and using interventions and restoration to increase the ability of corals to withstand climate change is in the very early stages. The guide describes some of the most more accessible and less risky interventions such as managed selection, where corals with desirable traits like high tolerance to temperature stress are identified and used in restoration. Managed breeding is where artificial propagation is used to increase population size, diversity, and fitness. Managed relocation, where corals are moved from a source area to locations beyond their historical range. Um, gradual pre-exposure of corals to stressors so that they are more, may be more tolerant under re-exposure to similar conditions, and changing symbi symbionts or the coral microbiome to types that enhance the stress tolerance of corals. So the purpose of monitoring for the success of restoration using these interventions is to evaluate if the use of the interventions has increased the ability of corals to withstand the effects of climate change. The guide does not suggest specific metrics to evaluate restoration using these interventions because it's still an evolving field. Successive interventions will be dependent on coral survivorship and the ability to pass on positive traits to offspring. 
monitoring methods and metrics that described in the guide for other goals are also likely applicable to monitoring restoration using interventions, but with such an evolving field, current literature should be reviewed to determine additional metrics or those that are um, relevant to the intervention that you use. Next slide, please. The final restoration goal identified in the guide is restoration for the purpose of research. Oral propagation and restoration activities provide many resources and opportunities to advance restoration science through research. Developing techniques and methods for successful propagation and outplanting has been the focus of most restoration research over the past few decades, but additional research is needed to advance restoration practices to be effective at an ecosystem level. Research to improve restoration requires a rigorous experimental design, quantitative data collection, and analyses. Because research may be beyond the scope of, or funding for restoration programs, partnerships between restoration practitioners and researchers can provide a way for both parties to benefit. Researchers are given access to corals to use in their experiments, and results from the research can be used to improve restoration effectiveness. The universal and other goal-based metrics and methods described in the guide will provide some data towards research efforts. However, additional monitoring with more detailed data collection occurring at shorter or more frequent intervals will likely be needed to answer individual research questions. Um, and with that, I'm ending my section and I'll turn it back over to Liz to um, give some concluding remarks and wrap it up. All right, great. Thank you, Allison. Um, and thank you to all the presenters today. Uh, it's been a true pleasure working with all of you. Um, so I want to quickly wrap up this portion of the webinar by drawing your attention to the additional resources that we have included in the guide. Found at the way back of the guide are the appendices, which provide a wealth of knowledge and resources, including the contact information to the database and the evaluation tools, the full evaluation tool and criteria, websites and citations to helpful resources categorized by the chapters that you're reading. It also included, includes a few SOPs for collecting mosaics, and that's where it also includes the web address for that super helpful webinar from last year on mosaics. It also has resources to help you document and report um, spawning observations from the larval propagation working group. And finally, a couple example surveys to get your program started collecting data on the socio side of restoration. So please take advantage of these resources and reach out to those who have provided these resources for more information. Then finally, where do we go from here? The methods that are provided herein are not all novel, but may be new to restoration or, and or may not be used to determine the success of restoration just yet. This is the first attempt to put together a comprehensive guide on monitoring restoration um, therefore, we ask that you get out there and test what we've put together and then provide feedback so we can gain confidence as a community that these are the metrics we should be using or that we miss something and we may need to make changes and modifications. We also fully understand that the field of restoration is changing quickly, as are the technologies that are and will be available for monitoring. So we look forward to seeing these advances and then incorporating them into the monitoring, um, into our monitoring uh, programs and into future versions of the guide when needed. So additional ways that you can make your voice heard is by joining this or other working groups. Uh, you can do this on the CRC webpage, which is listed under join the monitoring working group um, header there on the slide. And if you're interested in this particular working group, as Shay mentioned, we're hosting our large working group meeting on December 2nd at 12 o'clock Eastern time. Um, at noon. Uh, so join us for that call where we can continue discussion um, of this guide and any questions that may may still be um, uh, needed to be answered. So I want to say thank you again to all of the people that have contributed to this guide and thank you all for joining in and showing interest um, in bettering our monitoring efforts on coral reef restoration projects. We will now open it up for questions. Um, we are limited to about 20, a little over 20 minutes now um, after this presentation. So if we don't get to your questions, um, feel free to email, email them to me. My um, email's on the screen or put them on the uh, Reef Resilience Forum um, or in the chat box and we'll copy what's in the chat box over and we can address those questions offline and get back to you. 
Um, and like we said, you can visit us on, at our working group call on December 2nd, where we can also address some of those questions. So I'd like to open it up for questions. And again, these are ways you can ask, um, ask questions. So I'll look through the questions. We have a few typed in our chat box here. So I have one question is how and where can you learn more about different restoration efforts? Um, they would like to network within others in, uh, in the space, but am struggling to find projects. Um, I may actually direct this question to Allison with the database and the data that you're collecting, if that's okay. And if the speakers wanna turn on their, their videos and, and mics too, that'd be great. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your question. So we do have a um, restoration database that we've put together that um, people can submit their um, information about what their, you know, their restoration sites and what they're out planting and, um, you know, who they work with or work for and their partners. Um, we're trying to get that database online so that it's more accessible and we're working with the Nature Conservancy to try to get that done. But for now, um, if you want just a list of um, people who have contributed to the database. Now there's not everybody who's involved in restoration has contributed. I'd be happy to send that to you. Um, I believe also just, you know, reaching out to the, um, the CRC monitoring working groups, get, you know, getting involved in their quarterly calls will give you information about, you know, who is attending and who's doing restoration. Um, I think that's another great option. And I'll pass it over to anyone else on the, Team who might have some additional suggestions. Thank you. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. Thank you. Joining also, I guess, joining the Facebook group too. There's some groups that you can connect with on the CRC Facebook group um, as well. Uh, that might be an avenue beyond the database. Let's move to one. Maria Leon, are you? wanting to ask a question, I can unmute you. <laughs> Maria, do you have a question to ask? No. Okay. How about Haley Joe Carr? You had your hand up. Maybe not as well. We can work down the list. Um, how about uh, Lisa Karn? You want to unmute yourself? You can ask a question. Sorry, Liz. Actually, one of us needs to unmute them. The um, participants okay. can't unmute themselves. I had been clicking. It said it was self-muted and organizer, but. Lisa Karn, do you have a, a question you want to ask us? Doesn't look like we're getting through with those. Um, we'll go back to the, the chat box here. Um, one of the questions that Sarah has, uh, Sarah Frias Forrest, she wrote that, what are the, the top three metrics recommended for projects with no or minimum resources? Uh, I think that's a good question, and I think a lot of people would have that question. Um, and I would want to say, how about we go with top five and make those your universal metrics? <laughs> um, those are really designed for all levels of, of resources. We really try to make them the most basic that you can, but still giving us really good data for your restoration at different scales, as we were mentioning. Um, you can scale those metrics to your budget. So most the first two metrics or first three metrics, sorry, all you need is a 
tape measure um, or something to measure. You could use a stick, a PVC um, stick, and a da uh, data sheet or a slate. And then the fourth metric, you can actually use geographic distance to do your uh, genetic diversity. Um, and so again, there you would just need maybe GPS points um, or even estimating on a map where your location of your restoration sites are to know the distance between between your rest or your donor colony sites. Um, and then temperature, uh, like Amelia had said, is something that ideally if you have your own temperature logger, that's great. Um, but if not, you can do a lot of data sourcing from the web. There's a lot of free source data out there that you can that you can um, that you can get to uh, get an idea of the temperature within your restoration area. Anyone else have something to add to that? Okay, maybe we'll try one more time. It looks like Lisa has her hand up again. He has a temperature data uh, or comment on temperature data. Lisa, are you able to? Liz Shaver, am I doing something wrong? I'm up there. Can you hear me now, now, ladies? Hello? Yes, yes we can. Hi, Lisa. Hi, thank you. Sorry about that. It kept muting and unmuting itself. I don't know why. Anyway, I just had a quick comment on the temperature data collection because I'm currently doing that right now. And I have multiple temp loggers in multiple years. And um, maybe I misheard, but I'm no longer looking at averages and maximum and minimum because uh, it's not so meaningful over the long term. We've had a lot of um, radical differences in Belize in the last few years. So I I think I heard you guys say something about daily averages and monthly stuff. But um, first of all, if you have a lot of loggers out there, that's really tedious to be to be collecting that data every month. So we collect ours every year and we look at long term patterns. So. I just wanted to throw that out there that when I look back at averages and minimums and maximums, it doesn't really, it's not very impactful versus looking at the actual long term trends and changes. I think that's a, a really good point, Lisa, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, we are by no means saying that you can only average your temperatures and report them that way. Um, so if that ends up being what's more useful for your group, then that's absolutely essential. Um, we were just trying to find some sort of common ground, regardless of the type of data collected, whether that was in, in situ or ex situ or um, data pulled from another external source. But I think that's a really good point that there are a lot of these, maybe a bleaching event or something more small scale that you would want to look at on a finer scale than what we presented. Um, Edwin, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Edwin, you'll have to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask us a question. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I was trying and it wasn't working. Hi, uh, thanks for putting together such an interesting seminar. You actually made a great effort um, putting together 160 pages or so in, in less than an hour. Uh, my question is, what is your take in regards to the actual incorporation of looking at long-term monitoring of dissolved oxygen? For us, we have found that for some crazy reasons, we are starting to find in Puerto Rico, especially in the eastern coast at Anculebra, like frequent pulses of very low oxygen water masses passing by Culebra. And Culebra is an island with less than 2,000 residents. So this is not exactly like a local major problem. All of the sudden, in really uh, remote reef areas, you see sometimes spells 
the drop oxygen levels from about eight milligrams per liter down to something between two and four for a few days. And the explosion of, of SCTLD actually started after one of such spells. So I'm wondering if the behavior or, 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 or the performance of outplanted corals I, can actually be affected by such variations. So I think it's important to start looking at oxygen levels um, across this wide range of uh, scales. Just a comment. So I would like your opinion on that if you have any observations like that. Thank you. Edwin, this is an area of active research. Um, there's several researchers that I know of working on hypoxia in, in the Keys and various places elsewhere. So I think that's you bring up a really good point. And if people can add that research question to their monitoring, try it out. And, and maybe by the next iteration of this guide, version two, um, we'll know whether to, to upgrade it to a metric that should be monitored. Yeah, I think um, it's it's definitely kind of what Amelia was kind of alluding to um, with the last question. I think it's important to note that you know we're we're not necessarily saying that these metrics are the only thing that you should be monitoring. And by all means, if in your area you are are seeing these types of trends, especially with things like dissolved oxygen or something like that, and you have the means to monitor, um, for, for example, dissolved oxygen, um, you know, not everyone has the means to monitor dissolved oxygen. Um, that type of equipment isn't necessarily available to everyone, but um, that information can be very, very valuable. So, you know, more information is always, is always valuable. So, um, uh, like Shay said, if if there's enough information for us to include it in version two of the guide, we'll we'll definitely do so and and provide some type of um, you know metrics for that. So All right, we'll keep if this keeps working. Lois Nippard, if you can unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Yes, hello, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hi. Um, so I, uh, I'm just about to start up a reef restoration project in Mauritius, um, but the area that I'm looking to restore um, it has hardly any healthy wild colonies at all. So when looking at um, harvesting from wild fragments, you know, realistically, how far away can you actually go from the restoration site to collect your um, wild, healthy colon colony fragments? Um, I can work on that one, I guess, <laughs> tackle that one. This is something we're um, addressing a little bit more in another guide that the CRC is producing, which is the field-based guide, where we talk about collection methods and distances between collections as well and how to go about that. And if you don't have, and ideally you wanna work closely to your restoration project, you want to have your resources all nearby. So your donor colonies, your, um, or at least your nursery and your outplant sites, so your restoration sites. Um, if your donor colonies need to come from further away, that's okay. There's no limit to that. It's going to be the resources that you have available to you to keep those corals healthy um, and to keep them in safe conditions upon transport to, to your site. It can also be pretty costly to transport corals um, from far away, um, but I know people who are doing it by plane um, if needed um, or long distance sure. boat and, and land. Um, but ideally you would be, would, would be fairly close um, and some some permitting regulations may require you to stay within certain geographic boundaries. Um, so it's something to really take up with the, the stakeholders in your area on how um, transporting corals within the area that you're working in um, also is regulated with that. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Did anyone else have anything else to add to that? There's more experience on that. Um, Pastora, let's move on to you if you'd like to. I'll unmute you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi, thank you very much. Um, well, you said something about an alternative to uh, know like the difference of genes by a method using distance. I mean, it's complicated to find uh, the techniques to to know the difference by genes. No, uh, I'm sorry, you said something about uh, using distance to recognize these uh, differences. Yeah, so I think I understand that you're looking for clarification on uh, trying to assess genotyp gen genotypic diversity without using one of the sequencing techniques. Um, yeah. And so what we put forth in the guide was this idea of using the geographic distance between your donor colonies. So if you know that you collected your first colony from a certain set of coordinates and then another one from somewhere in the middle and another one even further away, you could probably most likely assume that the first and the last corals that you collected were the most um, genotypically diverse, that there might be more differences based on where they were collected from. So that's what we're trying to provide an option here for being able to use more of a assumption of different genotypes if you're not able to fund and collect for the more official sequencing. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And which distance do you think is the most um, accurate or, um, well, yeah, the, the optimus distance to recollect fragments and use them in other places without introducing some of them that won't um, mm. have like a negative impact? I don't know that if that's sure. possible. Yeah, that's a really good question and not something we got into in this guide because there are um, resources that came out of the CRC genetics working group um, that actually directly address this and recommend the number of fragments to collect um, to maximize genetic diversity. So we would be happy to point you in that direction for those resources. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, how about Sarah for your story? We'll unmute you if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, give some advice. Somebody talked about starting a coral reef restoration project in Mauritius. So uh, first thing is, if this project is related to the $10 million adaptation fund, um, there is um, a description of where to get uh, coral donors in Mauritius in that grant proposal. I wrote the whole grant anyway, so I remember that we talk about that, so that's one point. The second one is, and this also relates to how we do coral reef restoration. In the case of Mauritius, for example, because of the recent oil spill, uh, which nobody knows exactly what's in that oil because it, it was a mix of strange things. Um, it, some corals, many corals have been exposed to that toxic mix. And even though um, in cases where you don't see damage in the coral, they might have sublethal effects that eventually will uh, make your restoration project fail. So we also have to be aware of what is the recent um, environmental history of the corals we're going to use as donors. Uh, because there will be cases where there's been um, toxic effects of, that, of some discharge that are not still showing up. But we have to be aware of that. Great, thanks, Sarah, for that information for fellow restoration practitioners. Yeah, but uh, maybe I wrap up. <laughs> so, hi everyone. I'm Caitlin Lustick with the Nature Conservancy, um, and I'll just give a brief wrap up here. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers for all the work that they put into um, writing this guide and then presenting on it, and to all of our attendees that joined us. Obviously, we got a lot of questions that we weren't able to cover today, so 
You can find the answers to those on the Reef Resilience Networks forum. And also, um, as Liz said, you can join their meeting on December 2nd at noon and sign up for that at the Reef Resilience um, CRC page. Um, and then we have recorded this webinar, so this will be made available also on the Reef Resilience Network. And we have heard from a number of people that the guide is not currently downloadable. So we're gonna look into that <laughs> and we'll let everybody know where they can access that. Um, so thanks again to everybody uh, for taking the time out of your day to be here and we'll wrap up with that.